Good day. My name is Enrique Alvarez, and I'm here with Christy Porter for another very interesting episode of Logistics with Purpose. Christy, how are you doing today? I'm great, and I am really excited for today's guest. I know we say that every time. No, but, but yeah, you're you, right. You, yeah, when you get to have such amazing conversations, that's such a fun part of our job. Um, well, it's a very, it's definitely one of the highlights of my week because it's yeah. so, so many interesting and professional and just inspiring people that I just make my my week go easier and faster. So, uh, no, and we have a very special guest today. Some I would venture even unique and uh, mm -hmm. not very common, something that we haven't really spoken about in the past episodes. That's right. Yeah, completely new. Um, when I first learned about the work, I'm excited for everyone to hear because when I first learned about their work, which was through a series I saw on um, Hulu, uh, which I think may have come from the History Channel or something, I was just so utterly impressed. And it was one of those ways that you're like, oh, here's how people are solving a big problem. It was just such a creative endeavor. So I am immediately connected with Anna several years ago and have been following her on LinkedIn um, dutifully since then. So I'm excited to chat with her in real life, sort of, um, for the first time now. But this is Anna Bottinelli. Um, I hope I unfortunately don't have a beautiful Italian accent to say that with. So there's my Georgia accent. Um, president of the Monuments Men and Women Foundation. So Anna, welcome. It's lovely to see you. Hi, Christy. Thank you. Thank you, Enrique. And I'm so happy to be here with you today. And yes, you're right. I mean, this LinkedIn connection has uh, turned out to be a, a great opportunity to um, work together. So I'm really, really glad to delve into this uh, talk. Yes, fast. It, and you do such fascinating work and you have such a interesting background and um, yeah, I'm just, I'm thrilled for people to learn more about it and to bring sort of, um, some of history to the, to the present as well. So first of all, before we get into the Monuments Men and Women Foundation, let's hear a little bit about you. Clearly, this is not a Southern accent like I have or a Mexico <laughs> accent like Enrique has. So tell us a little bit about you, where you grew up in your childhood. Yeah, there is an Italy, Texas, sometimes. <laughs> yeah, sometimes when they ask me where you're from and I say from Italy, they say, oh, Italy, Texas. Well, no, the, the real one. So I am Italian uh, from Florence, born and raised. My parents are actually from um, northern Italy, but my mom uh, loved art. So they relocated to Florence before I was born. And uh, I was born and raised in, in, in Florence. Uh, not too far from all of the beautiful art and architecture. So um, I, although my parents at the time during my childhood didn't have jobs in the arts, they always uh, made a point of taking my brother and I to museums and making sure that it didn't get lost on us how lucky we were mm -hmm. that uh, we lived in a place where hundreds of thousands, millions of tourists travel to every single year. And there we were waiting for a bus stop uh, in the shadow of, uh, of the Cathedral of Florence, you know. So um, that's where I was born and raised. I spent my years through high school there. Then I went to Rome for, for undergraduate school and then to London for graduate. And um, I always studied art because I think since early ages, it, it was just a part of me. It took a while to realize, but um, that's what I, I, I loved uh, researching and studying and looking at. It sounds like you had it in your DNA all along. It yeah. just probably took a little bit. They were maybe asleep and then it just uh, all of a sudden <laughs> awoke in you. But no, it sounds like you got the love for art from your parents, your mom, it sounded like. Could you tell us a little bit more about kind of those early years in Florence, uh, something that you yeah. might remember from your parents or or the city or oh, for sure. yes for sure the arts uh and i say plural uh has always been a part of my life i've done a ballet i was a ballerina for more than 20 years and i do consider dance more of a ballet more than an, an art than a sport so um and i've uh, played the piano for many years so i think it's just my personality is very uh, art oriented and this um the, the beauty and the harmony that comes from it um the and there is so much to learn from art as well it it shows what greatness is sometimes our ego gets a little bit uh too big and we think oh we're doing really good and then you go to the uffizi and you look at some masterpiece and you're like oh well that's what greatness looks like <laughs> right. so it's a nice uh, self-check at times when you, you you think a little bit too highly of, of yourself not to uh, put yourself down but just to know yeah. what um, can be done with uh, someone's talent. And uh, I think 
it um, encouraged me to really use up my talents to uh, do whatever uh, the plan was, you know. Yeah, it sounds like it. And you um, must have, you must make your parents really proud because that's really even just unusual to the fact that they would move to Florence just for, right, the, just art for the, art. the art scene is really unique. And then how it has just seeped into every aspect of your life as well. So, um, so growing up or even maybe even now as an adult, who are the people that have been the most influential to you? Sounds like your parents, but um, <laughs> you may have some others that you want to add to that list as well. Well, Truly, it is my parents, uh, not just for the their um, exposure to the art that, of course, I'm grateful for, but that kind of happened in a fairly natural way. They're both inclined for that and being in Florence make it, makes it relatively easy because you have it right there. And unless you're blind to what's around, <laughs> right. Right. it's quite easy to develop an interest and a, and a, and a liking for those um, subjects. But I think what um, they really taught me and that I admire them for and that help, or help me in my um, adulthood and still do, it's their uh, work ethic for mm -hmm. sure. And the, the when when they moved to Florence, they had already started their careers. They were not so young, but they did start from scratch. I have relocated several times, and I think having my parents as an example that um, they 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 made it they made it work, and they restarted their lives without being intimidated that changing place and friends um, would be a challenge. That certainly is a part of me as I make my biggest move to Texas 10 years ago and the, all of the other moves uh, prior to that. And then I think their honesty, because I think it is really easy to start compromising your own values, especially when you enter um, um, work, when you start working and you have people that are asking for favors or you have to lean one way or the other. And my parents have always been very true to what they, to what their, their values are and have transmitted that to uh, my brother and I. And that I think is what is uh, really um shining in a way in the the work that I do today and the work of the foundation is being really true to what the values are and that is um the, the biggest uh gift perhaps and lesson I learned then uh, along with my parents there is my husband who I really really do look up to a lot he has um accomplished so much in his life and he's an idealistic I'm a realistic I think years of ballet train you to really know your limits and never really think too highly of yourself because there are challenges that you can't overcome if your body is in shape a certain way you just can't bend nature you know literally uh, speaking because in, in, in ballet you don't have to bend quite a lot so if your body is doesn't allow for for for, for something to happen you just know that your body um you, you have limits mm -hmm. and I think that made me very realistic but my husband is idealistic and he has made the impossible possible. So that is very inspirational as well, because sometimes I do find obstacles and I tend to uh, recognize, okay, these are obstacles I should step back. But thanks to his influence, I, I've been learning to push forward a little bit and not necessarily take no as an answer. Um, that's it. Wow. No, that's that's very interesting. It sounds like you had great parents and it sounds, of course, that you have a, a great husband. So uh, what was, by the way, what was the name of your parents? Bruna is my mom and Andrea is my dad. Bruna and Andrea. And before before I move into the next uh, question and continue our conversation down your career path and how you finally came to leading this amazing foundation, um, any favorite part of uh, Florence, any any special coffee place or ice cream place or anything if for we people that there. might be... Yes, might be listening to us right now. What what do you remember the most? About I have a Florence? list. Actually, what something that you get when you move to the United States and you're from Florence, everybody becomes your friend because they all want of course. the rest, <laughs> best restaurants and cafe whenever they travel to Italy. So now I'm, I'm prepared. Then I have my own list. So smart. That I can send away when people ask and I don't have to spend too much time. We will, we will have to see that list just yes. to make sure that you have it. Yes. We may have to well, include that in our show notes. Yeah. We should definitely yeah, include it in the show notes. Trade. Perfect. Yeah. Anybody that signs that that follows the foundation then can get a few Florentine uh, special path. <laughs> well, let's talk a little bit about your professional journey. Uh, and you started mentioning a little bit about that. But if you go back, if you can tell us a bit more about your career path and how you kind of, uh, what 
pushed you into the Monuments Men and Women Foundation? I mean, because it's very interesting from someone in Thorns to end up in Texas and then just leading such an interesting foundation. So uh, tell us a bit more. How, how did you get where you are now? Yeah, I think there was quite a bit of luck involved, which I think it always plays a, a role and certainly a lot of hard work. But um, when I went to Rome, I studied art history at an American university. It was already pretty clear to me that um, I love Italy, but I didn't see myself working and living there. But at the same time, I really like art and art history. And I couldn't make sense of going overseas to study what I could look uh, at any given day and go out and see in a museum and learn from it on learn about it on slides or uh, textbooks so um, I found this American University John Cabot University in Rome that seemed to be the perfect compromise to get the American education and kind of launch pad into the United States but at the same time remaining in Italy uh, and um, getting the benefit of having being surrounded by art right. so during my final months right before graduation I received an email from my um, Byzantine art professor that said that there was an author that was looking for an Amer for a, a researcher bilingual uh, Italian and English um, art historian or with an interest in art and history that could do research for his next book now this author was Robert Edsel and um, he had already published the monuments men which talks about what happened to cultural heritage during World War II in Europe, but had left Italy out because it's such Italy was an ally of Germany for uh, the beginning of the war. So it has a completely different um, history and he wanted to dedicate a whole book to that. Wow. Um, so that seemed the perfect summer job between undergraduate and graduate and I applied for the job and then uh, Robert was doing research in Rome and uh, we met. And what really uh, struck me was that I had I was born in Florence. I lived in Florence uh, 18 years of my life, uh, Florence and Rome. I studied, I had a degree in art history and I had never heard anybody <laughs> telling me that the art of my country, the art of my hometown Florence was at risk of being destroyed during World War War. And I thought that can't be. I mean, how can uh, people not know of this subject, especially maybe Americans are justified, people outside of Italy, but how can someone who is Italian and that already likes this uh, subject doesn't know? And that's because at the time, truly, the story was quite unknown. And that is what really got me so interested, I think, in, in the field of um, art history, it's really challenging to find something new to tell. I always, I mean, there are so okay. many written on like a nuance of this artist maybe was thinking about this when he painted the finger on the rock. You know, I mean, they, they really scholars uh, look for such nuances and it's incredibly interesting. Um, but it's here was a huge chapter of World War II that needed to be told. And to know that I could possibly play a role in it was really, really exciting. So it started as a summer job and um uh, Robert tasked me with some pretty hard challenges. I think he wanted to see if I was up to the task. My first assignment was to, um, so the Milan was bombed in uh, on August 15, 1943, mm -hmm. and several monuments were damaged. And when looking at military reports, some reports mentioned that um, it was uh, the bombing took place at night. Some reports say that the dark was, that the sky was pitch black and some reports say that there was a full moon and the amount of light was important to Robert whose uh, books are historically accurate because he wanted to make the point was it so dark that with the technology at the time there was more margin for error because bombers couldn't see or was there a full moon with a lot of light in the sky where they could have had a better chance of distinguishing a residential place from a monument, right? And so that was my my job, like figure out <laughs> it was dark, was it not? And I spent a month in Milan. I read every piece of article that was ever written on any newspaper at the time. Wow. And eventually I found this little note that said that there was a full uh, lunar eclipse that night. So I contacted oh. NASA, which has records of all of the lunar and solar That's eclipses. That's impressive. <laughs> and it matched the record. It's such a that, detective and, work. Yeah, almost. and that, it, that, that was really, I mean, it proved to Robert that I was up to the task and it proved to me that I love this investigative um, research work. Um, so, so it was, was a full moon, I guess. Oh, so there was, there was a full moon. <laughs> but it was an eclipse. eclipse. Yes, and it just that some reports focus more on the, wow. when the, 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 the moon was uh, covered and dark and others oh, wow. when the, the, the moon. <laughs> 
that, that that was um yes maybe I got lucky that I I, I wasn't able to figure <laughs> this out <laughs> but it did it did get me a job that's been lasting for 10 years so <laughs> well I'm sure you made quite a big impression that's for yeah. sure yeah that's amazing yeah. Well, you kind of hinted at it already. So let's really jump into it. So tell everybody about the mission of the Monuments Men and Women Foundation. And also you mentioned Robert and everything, but tell also just the origin of the organization. Yes. Um, well, uh, when I'll, I'll answer your second question okay. first, because I think it helps setting up the foundation. So sure. when Robert, um, Robert got interested in the subject, he realized that there were pretty much no books written on the subject. There is an exceptional book, The Rape of Europa, written by a scholar. It's a scholarly text. It's quite dense. It's the the book for anybody really wanting to learn the details and the nuances, but it does focus on the whole spectrum of what, what happened during World War II to cultural heritage. And it focuses, I would say, more on the bad guys, on the Nazis. Mm -hmm. And to Robert, when he started um, asking himself what happened to uh, cultural heritage in Europe during World War II and who were the people that saved it, he was more interested in the good guys. Yeah. And so he felt he needed to write books to let their stories known. To do so, he started looking for the real peoples that were still living. This is in the early 2000s. So the monuments, men and women that were still out there. Mm -hmm. The men were easier to find because they don't change last name when they married. The women not oh, so easy yeah. to find because they do change. And of course they were unmarried, right. they served and then they changed names. So that took a little bit uh, more research, but he was able to track down 21 of them, the only person um, wow. ever to meet as many. Wow. And he recorded their stories. He became really good friends with them, uh, not just them, also their families. He was invited to their um, memorial ceremonies when they passed. Wow. So we developed. he developed this wonderful friendship where it wasn't just learning about their what they did during World War II from the official reports, but it was learning from their own personal accounts. And as he was gathering all of their photos, all of their documents, all of their stories, he realized that he needed a foundation that would be the repository for all of these stories and that would um, preserve the legacy, honor them, and uh, make sure that this legacy was um, would have positive repercussions in the future. So the foundation was set up with these objectives. Now, we accomplished this first objective. I don't think organizations, uh, many organizations can say that there's like mission accomplished the way um, for, for, what, um, for what they were created. So we shifted um, after our first decade, our mission um, shifted more towards recovering the works of art that are still missing since the end of the war. The monuments, men and women, served during the war initially their service was to um well they, they volunteered i should say these were men and women that already had established careers they many of them had families many of them had children they were out of the age uh group that would have been drafted but they were all um architects um art historians artists librarians they had studied in europe many of them in italy they just couldn't stand uh, looking at the distractions that World War II was causing without going yeah, to Europe and so. help somehow. So mm -hmm. they volunteered initially to um, try and um, minimize as much as possible damages to, um, to monuments. It's only once they were already in Europe that they realized that there was a premeditated theft that the Nazis oh, were carrying wow. out. That's not how their mission started. Mm -hmm. But once they realized that thousands, if not millions of works of art had been stolen, then their mission expands to actually finding this art and returning it. And they did find millions of objects at the end of the war wow. and return them, but there's still a lot that's missing. And that's what now the foundation in this 2.0 phase, that's where the, the mission is uh, focused on. And, and a quick um, kind of follow-up question on what you said there to make it even clearer for everyone that's listening to us. So who who started this uh, organization or movement at the beginning? I know, and the other is, the other question I had for you is, is uh, were there primarily Italian people or there were just men and women all over Europe? I mean, who started the actual movement that then became the organization that then became the foundation that then reshifted towards <laughs> what you're just talking about? But it's an interesting, whoever came yeah. up with the idea first. Yes. That must have been uh, so there incredible. was a, a guy, a, a conservator, George Stout. He had served already in World War One, So that tells you the age, right? Not a, 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 not a young boy. And he knew that with, um, he had looked very carefully at what happened in Spain during the, um, the, the Spanish War in the late 1930s. And he saw 
that the weapon of destruction, the, the, the weapons of war had developed into a really uh, heavy bombs that caused a lot of damage. In World War I, mm -hmm. those bombs didn't exist. Um, the Spanish war was kind of a trial field to see how destructive these new weapons were. And so he was already, before the um, Hitler had even invaded Poland, he was already very alert and looking what was happening in Europe, knowing that had there been a second world war, the damage would have the damage to the the heritage in Europe would have been far worse than anything anybody had um, witnessed in World War One. So right um, in uh, 1940, that's when he uh, goes to uh, the, the the president, pretty much. I mean, there are several steps, but the president of the United States advocating for uh, a commission to be created. And the wow. technical will be the monuments men, um, the the monuments, fine arts, and archives commission that is part uh, of the US Army that would have people like himself and other experts to um, work together with the actual troops, advising them, um, drafting maps that would highlight the monuments or um, sites of historical importance so that when invading the country um, or to liberate the, the, the countries in Europe, they would know which targets to avoid in so wow. many wars. And so this is how it started. Now you think it started the first monuments man ever was Mason Hammond, a, a professor of classics. And uh, he landed in Sicily in August 43. So a month after the, the allies um, landed. But so the, the effort was an allied led and therefore it was the British and American led. Mm -hmm. So these, the total uh, number of monuments, men and women never went uh, more than 348 in total. They were never all of them at the same time in Europe. And especially during combat, there were just a handful in Italy and, um, and uh, less than 20 on the, on continental Europe. The, the it's only after the war that once they have to return all of this uh, millions of works of art that they need experts in different languages and different uh, fields uh, and that's when you start having monuments men from other countries so there are french monuments men and women uh, hungarian polish um belgium dutch so 14 countries were represented in all japan as well and um, no Italians, technically. Wow. There were several Italian experts that helped, but they were never officially recognized as part of the unit. Uh, and Italy, as like I said, changed sides. So it was, um, it put himself in a tricky position. Right. And of course the Allies had to draw the line on how much to trust mm -hmm. Italian personnel to uh, not Makes sure of where they stood. <laughs> That's incredible. Um, I, you also, you mentioned the history of the organization, but you've also had multiple roles there. So tell us, you said you've been there for a little over a decade. So tell us about kind of your progression and the taking on of different responsibilities and roles. And uh, clearly you're an excellent detective and researcher. So I know that's played a big part of your work as well. Well, the when I started uh, working for Robert on the book, I was working for Robert, the author, let's say, not Robert, the founder of the foundation. The transition into the foundation happened, again, great coincidence. I was pretty much done with the research for uh, Robert's book, Saving Italy, when a World War II veteran from Chicago called the foundation with eight books that he had picked up while serving in Italy from the countryside. From a bomb from a church that had been bombed, and he saw them lying in the countryside. He thought, as soon as it rains, this um, 15th century um, books will be destroyed. So he put them in his backpack and brought them home. And he had tried to return them for a while. His nephew had contacted the um, the Italian embassy in the 90s, the the consulate in Chicago. But at the time, nobody really at, in the 90s and early 2000s, nobody knew about this. So when this older person called and said, I have books to return, right. I was like, you're crazy. <laughs> you're yeah, right. that, that's, okay, let's keep them. Um, <laughs> but then the, he, his nephew saw the Monuments Men, um, the, the announcement of the Monuments Men movie. I don't think the movie had come out yet, but it had been announced. And so he got intrigued and read one of Robert Etzel's books. And so he realized that there was a foundation that was helping people returning. So the, he contacted the foundation and because of the book's 
coming from Italy, being an Italian, the, the foundation needed me and Robert Etzel, the author, didn't need me anymore as much. So it was kind of a smooth transition. We got involved with the foundation to return these eight books. And it was, um, I mean, yes, it was my first, the first restitution I was involved, but it was also so special because it was giving something back to Italy that um, right. being Italian, of course, it just means a little bit more if I can help my country getting some of um, what's uh, still missing. And we work, um, these were eight books that the University of Naples, which is one of the oldest universities in Europe, um, their library has manuscripts and very rare books. This eight, some of them, one of them was uh, the first, uh, one of the first, the, the first edition of Newton's Study of the Eye. Wow. Uh, they, were, I mean, they, they were extraordinary and in perfect conditions. And it's true, had this um, soldier not picked them up, they would have probably um, got yeah. destroyed, lost. As soon as the, the, the rainfalls of the fall started, they would have um, just um, disintegrated. So in a way, he was... Um, a custodian for 70 years and he was wow. celebrated by the embassy for coming forward and Italy was very grateful we worked with their military police in Italy that handles this sort of uh, restitutions and it was just a great great celebration mm -hmm. but that's how my transition into the work of the foundation happened and once I was there I I, I stayed Didn't and like <laughs> you never left <laughs> So I continued doing research and I was um, just a researcher for quite a, a long time. Then uh, I became more involved with um, the hiring of researchers. I have a... How, how big is the organization? If you don't mind me interrupting. Quite small. It is quite small. Uh, we accomplish so much that people tend to think mm. we're this. Um, first right. Of it sounds all, like you guys have tons of things to right. do. Yeah. Yes. No, we have, you know, when you have dedicated people, you don't need right. many. You just need quality. Yeah. Uh, we're a team of five. Wow. Um, of which of who um, Robert Etzel, I'm counting him among the five and he's volunteering nice. his time. So he's not really part of the team as much as he, but he is the soul of the foundation. And then we have some um, experts in, in Europe, but our research is so um, diverse that rather than having a huge staff, we just have great contacts. Mm -hmm. And right. so when we need something, we will call uh, someone up and everybody, I, I think something we've been very successful at doing throughout the years is um, building an excellent reputation. And um, everybody's always is very happy to help us when we need some um, specific research that, uh, you know, it might not make sense to necessarily have someone that speaks Hungarian, but it's great to have a contact that if we come up with some research right. in that language can step in and help. Um, wow. That's yeah. so cool. Um, well, you mentioned a second ago about The Monuments Men, which is a great movie <laughs> as well. Hollywood thought it would be a great book to turn into a movie and they did 2014. So for anybody who hasn't seen it, go find it, go rent it. It's George Clooney, Matt Damon, two of my favorites, uh, Bill Murray, John Goodman, and so many uh, so many others. It would take us a long time just to list all those stars in it. But I also understand that you had a connection to the movie as well. So what was that? Well, that was right when I transitioned into the foundation. Perfect okay. time. Yes. So I wasn't, uh, I, was, I wasn't at the time as involved in the all of the correspondence with George Clooney's team, because I was just a I was that would have been fun, right? though. <laughs> that was, so, um, in the but what Sony did, um, Sony is um, the, the the producer of uh, together with with Smokehouse, which is uh, George Clooney's company. They produced the movie, and they really embraced the whole mission. It wasn't just making a movie. First of all, they did it as quickly as they could because they really wanted as many monuments men to still be alive to watch it. Uh, that was a choice. They didn't have to do it. They could have taken four yeah. years. Uh, they did it fast because they knew this men are and, and women are in their late 90s and every day matters. And um, they embrace the mission, which is to raise visibility. It doesn't do what, what good does it does to make a movie, but then they wanted to really reach uh, students and educators. So they created a website that it, it no longer exists, but at the time uh, for a year uh, since from the launch of the movie, and for it was an educational website in support of the movie and the foundation created all of this extra content where mm -hmm. professors and teachers could go and look at it was a this um, multimedia map where you could follow in the footsteps of the monuments men and trace the works of art and see where they had been hidden all wow. of that all of that content that's what uh, we worked on and provided and then to uh, George Clooney's credit because I, I I'm, he didn't 
didn't have to do it. He recognized, he was so grateful to all of the work that we had done in the years that he invited all of us researchers to Berlin to be on set for three days. Wow. So we were on set and um, saw him, I mean, which being on set of a movie is fun the first five minutes minutes and dreadful the last the, the other 10 hours because it's the same <laughs> thing over and over and over again but you still get to be on set with this uh, stellar cast and like I said he didn't have to do it but it really showed how grateful and fully understanding of the of the um of the work that we had put throughout mm -hmm. the years so he so we were um so we were all there to see him film a couple of the scenes and that was great and he even spent some time with us showing some of the films he had already um uh, shot and getting our feedback again he doesn't wow. I don't know you think of George Clooney right he's one of the most famous Hollywood yeah. stars and right. he could be very arrogant and very full of himself instead he was as normal or have you talked to his third assistant yeah <laughs> right exactly no he, he it was just really for us that, you know, you rarely get the credit when something like this happened and you always do a lot of work behind the scenes, but it's not necessarily recognized. It was just very validating for us to be there. Mm -hmm. And then he invited us all on the premiere tours. So from New York to, uh, again, Berlin, Milan, London and Paris. Wow. So that was um, not all of us joined in all of the all of the places, but I was in Italy. I joined the Milan and Paris and we all kind of took turns. But again, that was uh, quite exceptional and uh, celebrating in Paris, the end of the premiere tour with all of the cast um, dancing. And wow. it was certainly uh, quite a unique experience. Ooh, a Hollywood experience. Yeah, I know. It sounds like a very, very uh, amazing um, experience, unique experience for sure. And something that is, as you said, very validating and speaks mm -hmm. very highly of the people and uh, the people that were involved in the project, not only uh, the actual organization, but the movie itself. So I, exactly, congratulations exactly. to them. We'll, we'll add the, the yeah. link to the movie on our, on our show yes. as well. It's, it is a really good movie. It is too. Good. Now, well, the, the book is too. So and anyway. the book is yes, too, I, now I'm going to have to go back and read the book. Yeah. Yes. We should put a link to the book <laughs> yes. as well. And you're right about that. Um, so you've worked on multiple things since that one. I mean, that one probably was uh, a little bit more of the, uh, I guess, eclectic in many different ways and probably one of the one that you remember the most for all the traveling and all these different things that happened. But what other projects or or have you worked on past uh, or, or recent? I mean, what other kind of projects are you working on right now? Well, um, returning works of art is um, our main mission. And we have returned more than 30 objects since in, in the last decade. That takes um, a lot of work. And sometimes I do get um, impatient and I want to announce a return, but then I say, oh, we're not there yet. So um, sometimes we have this uh, months and months where we don't necessarily come out with news. And that's because we're really hard at work researching. And um, if we had more people, and to have more people, we need more funds, then we would probably go faster. But it is such a, a an exceptional learning curve anytime we research one of these uh, leads that we receive, because they all are unique in their own way. So there is an equity cut, uh, a cookie cutter system that you can apply. And it's kind of on a on a, um, automatic, you know, you check this, you check this, you could, then this is the result. Everything needs to really be taken on its own and analyze the wartime context uh, in which it sets itself. It could be a different type of object. We've returned books, but we've done tapestries, we've done sculptures, we've done coins, we've done uh, paintings, you know, each medium requires a different approach. But I've been involved in several of these uh, restitutions. The last one, was in um in Ulm in Germany this summer. I, I, I was in Europe. So we um I traveled to to Germany to return this to nine, ten coins that had been taken from the museum and a sculpture that wasn't part of the museum collection, but it has ties to the city of Ulm and it was a really um lovely ceremony that we did there. And before then, a few months um before we returned two drawings to the National Museum in Warsaw. Uh, and that was um, that was a very big deal. This um, drawings done by a Polish artist. They were part of a series of um, eighteen other of, of twenty other drawings. Eighteen of them had been found at the end of the war. Two had been missing since 
last November, and we were able to return the last two that complete a series. So it's already wow. uh, exceptional when we, you can return something to a museum, but when you can even just return something that is part of a series of um, these little sketches of several towns in Poland, uh, it was really meaningful. And the, the officials at the in Poland were um, truly ecstatic. Poland has more than sixty thousand works of art missing on their list of uh, of works of art missing. So it's a it's a long list, but you know it takes um, one. You need to start somewhere. So every little object that is returned uh, matters. And every country has uh, their own list. I mean, they basically have a list of things that they have. It would be missing, easier. Like a, if they did like a lost and <laughs> yeah. found kind of thing you're like the lost and found of uh <laughs> world uh but unfortunately there is it would be what would be really helpful is if there was a centralized database where all of this country have, and the reason so yes i think each country more or less knows what is missing but this database don't speak among themselves right. don't communicate among themselves and that's what makes the research harder um, because if you don't know exactly what country, if you're working on a, on, on an object, but you don't know what country was taken from, then you really have to check all of these databases. Right. And usually the more important the works of art are, the more likely they are to have made it to the database, something that's less important than it might not even be um, recorded anywhere. Um, but, uh, Especially, I guess, if it's uh, a public or, you know, like a public museum versus a private collector, a family heirloom, that yeah, kind of thing. Exactly. exactly. Absolutely. Do you have, uh, I'm curious, those are a couple of good examples. Do you have a favorite example of a project that you've worked on? A favorite, well, I said this, uh, returning these eight books to Italy yeah. was certainly a favorite um, because of helping uh, Italy. Yeah. Just, uh, but I think maybe my favorite we returned, we returned three paintings to a small museum. Well, it's not even a small museum. I mean, it's a the, the town museum of um, of Dessau. It's a town in East Germany, and they had um, more than six hundred works of art taken. Many of them probably by the Soviet army, and they the curator there started working when she was quite young and was um, was soon to retire when we call her up telling her that we had these three paintings that um, had been taken during the war by a veteran, by, by, by a soldier that contacted us because he really wanted to return them. And she had spent her whole life um, hoping that three that some paintings will go back. Her job was to care for the wartime losses and look for them. That was her job. And she spent 50 years working in this museum and nothing ever showed up. And she was three months wow. from retiring. And here we are calling her and she started crying on the phone. And she said, wow. I'll have to call you back because I can't speak right now. And then she called us back like an hour later yeah. and said, okay, um, um, let, let, let's, um, let's go over this again. Wow. And it, it was just so meaningful to her. And then when we traveled to Germany and we hung them back on the walls of the museum, her smile, it was this uh, rewarding sense of gratitude that she had spent her whole life hoping yeah. and, 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 oh, wow. and this is why when, um, so when, uh, people come contact us, we really stress the fact that nobody is going to get upset with them. On the contrary, there is a unanimous sense of gratitude mm -hmm. for um, almost being custodians of these objects that who knows what could have happened to them and for coming forward and returning them. It's a, they're very moving experiences. But yes, I think this one was special because you really saw the, the impact that it has on the, the people that are on the receiving end. Absolutely. I mean, that their life's work, right, being kind of validated or uh, realized at that moment when they finally return some of these art pieces, which are literally invaluable, and, and they have so, so much filled with emotions as well, right? So it's not only the actual value, but the emotions and the, the history that they carry. Um, we're in logistics, right? So we're a supply chain company, and, and we love logistics and this industry. Could you tell us a little bit more about the actual process or of retrieving some of these and then also maybe some of the challenges that you have faced uh, in the past, right? How, let's say, and I'm guessing every different art piece has a different way of retrie being retrieved, but in general, I mean, the paintings that you just talked about, how, how do they actually get to the final destination? Yeah, well, we have a toll free number that people can call and we don't charge anything for this we kind of really follow in the footsteps of the monuments men and women that return works of art it didn't matter who it didn't matter how 
And uh, so this is something that we don't charge for. We get contacted daily by people that have either they just um, bought something and they're unsure or they have uh, something that was passed down by their relatives and they know that they served during the war and they want to make sure that there is no issue with them. We have to high grade constantly because of being a small team. If we get something that is really, really perspective, then we might put something else that we're working on on hold to shift our um, our attention there. So we're constantly kind of shifting around, but um, we tackle everything from different points of view, which I think is a strength of our team. We're not just our history focused or legal. Uh, we have a military historian, we have a, a conservator expert, we have a provenance research expert and, and our historian. So we approach it from different uh, points of view to create almost a bulletproof um, view of what the context of the, how the, the, the object came, um, became lost or came about, came in the possession of this person. And then we work with the families. Like I said, we, we, the, the family needs to come forward and give up the object voluntarily. We're not a law enforcement agency. We cannot knock on right. people's door and right. go in and say, we need to take this off your wall. We really need people to um, to come to us and give it. And so far, we've had no problem. Uh, we even the people. It happened in a couple of instances. Um, somebody was um, maybe was exiled for the three paintings to Germany. Wasn't too sure about returning them because he had lost several bodies during the war. I was like, I'm not giving something back to Germany. Um, but uh, when uh, so many of my friends uh, died. Right. But uh, when that happens, then we, we will talk to the person. We um, will share more about the monuments, men and women, more about what happened during World War II, because maybe they don't know. They don't know the German museums maybe are the museum that suffered the most during the war. And um, it wasn't their fault. And so right. it might, we don't push people. We don't force them. We just uh, work with them. And when they when the moment is right then they will turn they will come to us and turn it over so this has always happened in only a couple of instances of uh, forgeries we had to involve the fbi with which we have great uh, relationships uh, but if we can avoid it we 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 do all we can to avoid it and then once we realize once we have we complete all of the research and we know where something should be returned to that's when we involve um usually the um, a representation in Washington, because it's very, our work is successful as long as there is visibility of the things that we return. It would be great to just go and hand them over. Right. But if nobody knows of them, then nobody knows that this is what we do. Nobody knows that they will be praised and thanked for coming forward. Mm -hmm. And we need people to know so that more things come out. Mm -hmm. So we always um, have some sort of ceremony either in Washington or at one of the consul uh, of the consulates of the country that this um, object is going back to and then we have a similar ceremony in the country uh, that's receiving it and this way it pleases kind of both constituencies right. it pleases the people in the states especially if they're old then they cannot necessarily travel they get the sense of closure where they can participate and hand over the object and then the people in Europe also get their uh, celebration for welcoming something home Wow, that's super. But cool. The challenges you ask about challenges. The challenges are that all of this is expensive, right. <laughs> and um, right. it's not. You know, there is a lot of we. If we could get a dollar for all of the emails we receive praising us for what we do, we would have no issue. <laughs> <laughs> Except, you know, well, you can't pay things with the emails, can right. you? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, um, you know, that's the challenge um, is that uh, th there's clearly a need for what we do and uh, an, an appreciation is just not so easy to translate into support. And so uh, governments uh, don't necessarily pitch in. I mean, I would have hoped that, hey, if yeah. you're returning something to Germany, for example, or Italy or Spain, I mean, I would ask as a country, wouldn't you like to pay for that to be returned? <laughs> yeah well that would be nice it's yours <laughs> like no, then because we don't charge we don't create a clause in a contract okay. that says we're going to give so this it's back entirely to voluntarily it, but, if it, but they exactly. could pitch in if they, they want could. they could do, do they or we'll just put that out there they cheap. could <laughs> yes <laughs> they could. all right they could in a couple of instances we had families that did receive something back that um help with the donation so where if you're a government yeah. and you're listening to us please right. go ahead pay, the pay. Tell your friend. <laughs> yes go ahead christy <laughs> well I'm, I'm also curious because 
it's been 70 over 70 years since World War II. And of course, war, as we are well aware of every day's headlines, war and conflict are still ongoing around the world. Um, and so, you know, and always people are looking to, uh, as you mentioned, the, it was started because somebody recognized this form of cultural oppression and um, wanting to remove cultural heritage and the identity of a country and things like that. So as you studied the, the history that comes with this and in your research, I'm curious what lessons you've learned from your work that you want others to know just about cultural heritage or preservation or how this, you know, we may not recognize it. As you said, people, the other issue with your work is there are little things scattered all over houses, all over the world and things like that as well. So when it comes to cultural oppression, how do we recognize it? How do we stop it? And just what would you like people to know on that topic? Oh, that's a, that, that yeah, is just a, if you can put that in 20 <laughs> seconds or less. Yeah. <laughs> this is a focus of its own. What's your plan uh, for world peace? Go. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think, I think here's the big lesson of what happened during World War II. The, the genocide was so successful in all the wrong ways. Right. Because Hitler didn't just um, kill the Jews. He still, he stole from them. He took their, their, property away so that they would witness that everything that they owned everything that they believed in everything that they liked was being taken away and i think this is really the recipe for mass um, genocide and we saw it in the more recent years we saw it with uh, isis they didn't go straight and kill people they destroyed their art they destroyed their monuments there is this sense of humiliation that is part of the killing that takes place right mm -hmm. so in a way what we're learning from World War II is that when we see a people destroying another people's art and culture and monuments, something worse is going to happen. Mm -hmm. It's a warning sign in a way. And that should really uh, start the alarm for the governments to act to minimize damage because it's not just the sake of destroying art for its own sake. So that to me is a very big yeah. lesson that can be learned and that can really be applied um, forever because right. unfortunately bad guys that will be bad guys forever. And we see it right. in Ukraine, some photos that you see of how monuments are being protected or works of art being taken into storage, they could be superimposed to uh, pictures of World War II. They're the same. Mm -hmm. So this is happening now as it happened um, almost uh, well, more than 70 years ago. Yeah. So this would be my first big lesson. Sure. Now, as it comes to the small uh, objects, the um, I think... Anybody that has something that was brought home, that was brought to the United States, especially from Europe during the war years, should ask themselves, where did this come from? Mm -hmm. In the end, all of the, the works of art that were taken had been created prior to the war, right? So at some point, where were they during the war? Did this, uh, was this, um, had this been stolen? Had this been um, in a house that was bombed and then scattered? You know, that I think it's our duty if we know that there could be a connection with the war to ask ourselves, mm -hmm. is this work of art truly, can I own it? Or is there maybe someone else that's out there looking for it? And this is what the foundation does. We're just available to kind of answer this question. Mm -hmm. We, um, it, It's not a, a quick answer, but we, uh, we address every single lead that comes through our door. We address it. We are proud of never letting one email unanswered. So mm -hmm. we really try as much as we can to help everybody Incredible. thank you anna yeah thank you very much for sharing all this uh it's been a really engaging conversation and uh thank you so much for leading this amazing foundation as well so if you had to uh, give a call of action to future generations right people that are listening to us uh younger generations in particular with everything you have learned not only from studying it because you have extensively studying uh have been extensively studying all this but just from what you've seen and um, what, what would that be? I mean, what what do you want like future generations to learn to create uh, just a better future for for the world and for the history and the arts and monuments? I think my generation, uh, especially as an Italian, uh, grew up thinking that the government would take care of everything. Um, in Europe, especially, or uh, we don't have the philanthropy 
uh, the sense of philanthropy that the United States has, where um, donors do help support in the arts. All of the the museums here are privately pri are private uh, and and support by donors. In uh, Europe, most of them are government owned. So there is this tendency, especially in Europe, thinking that the government will, will take care of that monument. The government will restore this work of art. The monument will the the government will protect it. Well, the government doesn't have enough money to do all of this. So it truly is our responsibility to care for this um, for this um, monuments and art and to play whatever role we can in their preservation. I'm sure that when Notre Dame was burning down a couple of years ago, I'm sure everybody around the world uh, held their breath and of was course. concerned of what's going to happen. It doesn't matter if the person was going to museums or not on their free time, they still care that Notre Dame wouldn't collapse to the ground. And that's because inherent, inherently, I think we all care. Mm -hmm. Even if art is not a priority yeah. of life, this cultural heritage of Western civilization, Eastern civilization, it it's part of us. And if, as, if something is part of you, then you need to play uh, a role in making sure it's it, it, it's safe and it remains for our children to see and our grandchildren so it's it's too easy to just sit back and think that someone else will do the job we each have to do our job mm -hmm. and whether that's to be directly involved whether it is to just give um, financial support if one is able to or to just spread the word and raise awareness uh, we can each find our own way of uh, playing a role yeah well said yeah very, very absolutely nice, yeah. And you mentioned you're in phase two of or 2.0 of the um, organization. Can you tell us anything else that's coming up next, or is there a phase three already in the works? Well, no, we're we're, we're pretty busy with our phase two. So okay. the phase two is really focusing on returning on on finding works of art that are still missing and returning them to the rightful owners. We um we created um we launched in March a very fun and engaging. Um, game. It's a, I have it here. It's a deck of playing cards. So cool. World War II most wanted art. So these are cards that feature 52 of the most um, important, if you want to say, works of art that are still missing since the end of the war. And these are works of art that did then um that we have every reason to believe have survived in other words they were not destroyed during the war they were not uh, there are no reports that uh, would make us believe that they burned down or something like that and in fact many of them you see that when the the picture on the card is in color it's because they resurfaced on the market in more recent years right wow. when you have the when they're in black and white then it's more likely that they they did then they, we lost track of them during the war years and um, they're somewhere, but we don't know where. Mm -hmm. But the ones in color, it's because in the 60s and 70s and even 80s, uh, they were in the market. They were sold at auctions and on auction by auction houses that um, are all of the names that we know of. But because of their um, privacy clause, they cannot disclose who the buyers were. And so these are, we have, these don't belong to the, these don't belong to the current owners mm -hmm. but um, we cannot like i said force them to hand them over but we can raise visibility about all of these works of art that are missing in a way of devaluing right i mean if everybody knows that these are stolen and, and uh, people own work of art a little bit because they like the painting a lot because it's a good investment and so <laughs> it becomes a pretty bad investment if you have um, quite a bit of money tied up in something that is not yours. Yeah. And so this was a very, um, a, a, an exceptional idea that one of our board members had. And we worked for two years to make it happen. We collaborated with the uh, heirs of this, uh, of the Jewish families or the families that these paintings were taken from. We work with um, experts in the field, legal representatives, and uh, the FBI has praised it. The U.S. Army has praised it. And the... Uh, so this is uh, the most recent exciting project yeah. that we launched and that really allows anybody to get involved. And with uh, playing cards is a fun, um, it's just a fun approach to this mm -hmm. subject, less intimidating than maybe reading a book on the subject, reading a book. And, and then the other big thing that will, uh, will um, be completed next year, the National World War II Museum um, in New Orleans has an exceptional campus. They're finishing their third building. Um, and the ground floor of this building will have a permanent exhibition about the monuments men and women. One of the spaces will recreate a salt mine 
um, the paintings at the end of the war, well, the works of art at the end of the war were found in uh, soul mines and castles, well, mines and castles, copper mines, soul mines. And um, it must have been quite a shock for this monuments man to go uh, hundreds of feet underground and find um, some of the Europe's masterpieces um, in the dark of these caves. And so the museum embraced our suggestion of creating a salt mine like mm -hmm. Rome to kind of give the visitors and they receive more than 700,000 visitors a year. So that's gonna be a huge crowd that will be exposed to the mission of the monuments men and women. We're quite Maybe excited. You, uh, you can invite your friend George to show up as well. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Or or anyone else on that movie, I right. guess. Such a but, great uh, cast. Yeah, you can we, we're not going to just yeah. right. <laughs> if George is not available, Matt maybe. But uh, anyways, uh, no, this is fantastic. Thank you very much for sharing. It's a great idea, and it has been a, a very very interesting conversation. As said before, I'm pretty sure that people that are listening to this are not only excited and inspired, but they're also might have a lot of questions, right? I mean, maybe they they want to contact you. Where 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 can they contact you? What's that? Uh, and we'll put all the information uh, when we post this interview, but, but what's a good way to get in touch with you or support the Monuments Men and Women Foundation? Well, we have a website, monumentsmenandwomenfoundation.org. And um, there are several ways of contacting us. We, have, we, we, we try to make it as easy as possible. We have different forms that people can fill out, whether they're reporting a work of art so that it goes straight to the researchers that handle um, that sort of inquiry. And then we have other forms that is just to contact us. They can uh, sign up to our newsletter. We come out with three to four paper issues every uh, year and other communications. We don't uh, spam mailboxes. So I highly suggest to sign up because <laughs> we're not going to be, uh, usually few people unsubscribe because we, we, um, we don't send too many emails only when we have really uh, something great to, to announce. Mm -hmm. And um, we have a membership program that allows people to become members of the foundation. We don't have a museum, right? And the, um, but the monuments men and women of World War II had um, connections with museums right. all over the country and actually all over the world. So we created a monuments men and women museum network with the idea of gathering under the same umbrella, all of these museums from all over the world that share ties to the monuments men and women by becoming members of our foundation, you get free entrance to these museums all over the world to the ones that have joined so far. And I'm sure many more will join, but it's uh, more than 30 museums, I think now including wow. Um, the Auckland Museum in New Zealand and a couple of museums in England and in uh, in Germany. So mm -hmm. it's um it's a, it's um it's being a nice idea that um that addresses what could seem a shortcoming of not having a facility to welcome people, but this way we are letting them, we're allowing them to to go into and explore all of these museums. So there is memberships, there is signups, there is newsletter. And otherwise, there is a very straightforward donation that we we will yes. say no, we'll take it. <laughs> it. No, absolutely. And uh, thank you once again. Uh, I guess before we let you go, uh, Anna, if you don't mind uh, saying your last name one more time before I butcher it on the <laughs> what is how Anna do you pronounce Anna Bottinelli. Bottinelli. It just sounds so much better yeah, when you, you say it. But Anna Bottinelli. Good. And um, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure talking to you today. Absolutely. Of course, come with our full thank support. You. I'm sure a lot of our listeners are going to be very excited and interested in this conversation. And Christy, you want to close the show for us this time? Yeah, I'm I'm just so excited for this conversation. I know, this is great. It's been a long time coming. I love World War II history. And um, so, yeah, I think it's really amazing and hopefully the cause will continue. There's still obviously a lot of work to do. And I think one of the really unique and interesting things that you guys do is get the general public involved and even just your um, advice on cultural her heritage and looking around at your family heirlooms. Do you have something that you know came from Europe during World War II that you can just ask the question? I think that's a really simple step that a lot of people can take at really no matter where they are in the world. Um, and yeah, looking to see where did that come from? Does it belong to us or does it need to go back to somebody else? And I think that's a really great first step, but I love the fact that you um, really depended on the public to get the word out and to get involved in the mission instead of just locking yourselves up in a research room and, and taking all that on yourselves. It's really incredible. So thank you for the amazing work you, you do. This was 
wonderful. Um, can't wait to continue the conversation into the future. Can't wait to hear how our listeners love this conversation as well. But thank you so much for your time. And thanks for everyone for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you so much. Have a good day. 